this project studies um, the relationship between uh, literature and science in the modernist period, that is um, roughly between the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And we began this project with a simple question. Um, did literature know things science did not? This may sound like a strange question, but it's not when we recall that the um, divides between literature and science were anything but clear in the modernist period. On the one hand, we had a lot of writers who were trained as scientists or who took an active interest in scientific research. And on the other hand, uh, we had a lot of scientists who were uh, in part often trained as experts in the literary of the literary canon uh, or who also took an active interest in uh, literature. Um, to give but one very famous example, the uh, work of Sigmund Freud in uh, psychoanalysis is completely unthinkable without his knowledge of the classic literary canon. But at the same time, we also had writers like Arthur Schnitzler or Alfred de Blin who were trained in medicine and who, uh, through their fiction, also explored the machinations of the human uh, mind, albeit in a very different way. And so this uh, competition, or if you want, the complementarity between uh, science on the one hand and literature on the other hand producing insights, we see uh, almost in all uh, areas of uh, scientific knowledge production in the modernist period. So another motivation for our work is the fact that um, science itself went through massive changes during the modernist period. Students around 1850 had a very limited uh, number of scient officially sanctioned scientific disciplines to choose from uh, if they were to enroll in the university. By 1950, so a century later, um, the amount of scientific disciplines, officially institutionalized disciplines, has multiplied radically and there is an enormous amount of scientific disciplines and sub-disciplines to choose from, which taken together appear to study almost every aspect of human life on Earth, if not the universe. So what we see happening in the modernist period is um, that on the one hand, the modern university establishes itself. On the other hand, that our present day um, understanding of what science is, is established. Um, and what is more, science increasingly comes to lay claim on the production of knowledge, leaving a lot of writers at the period or at the time also wondering what was uh, the knowledge they could still uh, claim for themselves. Besides studying uh, a great variety of cases, we also decided to zoom in on uh, the relationship between literature and a, a set of particular sciences. And we chose three disciplines which shared a number of things. First of all, um, they were, uh, during the modernist period, in uh, the process of forming themselves as officially institutionalized sciences. Second of all, we chose sciences that um, are in, in a way composite enterprises, and by which I mean that they required specialists with different backgrounds. And third of all, uh, the sciences we chose are all concerned with uh, somehow with the origins of things. So from, from what we now call the social sciences and humanities, um, we selected the discipline of archaeology, which is concerned with the study of the remnants and the origins of human culture and society. Um, from what we now call the life sciences and medicine, we selected the discipline of genetics because that studies uh, the origins of all living organisms on Earth. And from what we now call the um, uh, physical sciences and engineering, we decided to focus on cosmology and astronomy because cosmology is concerned uh, with the origin of the universe as such. One of the oldest branches of archaeology in Europe is that of Egyptology, that is, the study of ancient Egypt as it existed for nearly seven millennia, long before there was even talk of Europe. When I say ancient Egypt, you might instantly think of the bust of Nefertiti or the tomb of Tutankhamun. The discovery of both of these dates back to the modernist period, which witnessed something like a wave of Egypt mania. In fact, the words Ancient Egypt might also make you think of mummies, spectral pyramids, or adventurous archaeologists raiding tombs. Well, 
All of these figures were first popularized in novels and films in the modernist period. My own research takes the early 20th century's popular interest in Egyptology as a starting point to investigate how European writers of the avant-garde in Russia, France, Germany, the UK, and beyond all related to ancient Egypt. I have found, among others, that many writers were fascinated with the hieroglyph because it drew attention not just to languages verbal, but also its visual potential. Hieroglyphs thus informed much of modernist literature's experimentation. In a more general sense, many avant-gardists looked to ancient Egypt as a culture that could perhaps be used to jumpstart a new European culture, one which might be less West-centric and more open to the world with its many wonders and mysteries. What could be more appealing to a writer's imagination than a lost civilization we know for sure once existed, but about which we know almost nothing? Take the Etruscans. Etruscan civilization thrived between the 8th and the 4th century before Christ in central Italy. When Rome conquered Etruria, much of Etruscan culture, including Etruscan language and possibly literature, was either completely obliterated or assimilated by Rome. Italians thereafter mostly forgot about this ancient civilization from Etruria and focused instead on their Roman past. That changed, however, after the unification of Italy in 1861, when a renewed interest in early Italic cultures gave a boost to new systematic archaeological excavations. Stunning discoveries happened in the first half of the 20th century, including the discovery of the famous Etruscan Apollo, known as well as the Apollo Vei. Such discoveries led to the creation and the professionalization of a specific branch of archaeology supposed to study Etruscan remains, Etruscology. Such discoveries also sparked the imagination of a number of modernist authors like Gabriele D'Annunzio, Curzio Malaparte, D. H. Lawrence, Aldo Saxley, Anatole France and Raymond Queneau. In their texts and through their writing, they tried to reconstruct what Etruscan life was like and what Etruria was like. My work deals with these issues and more and demonstrates that authors from the modernist period were not just bystanders, but also active participants in the construction of knowledge uh, about the lost Etruscans. From the late 19th century onwards, scientific knowledge about the origins of life and the origins of human life in particular grew exponentially. This knowledge spanned a spectrum from Darwinian evolutionary theories to discoveries in the morphology of living organisms and eventually led to the molecular genetic analysis we know today. Like other scientific fields, genetics grew unevenly. But unlike other scientific fields, it sparked and in return was fueled by an enormous public debate around the turn of the century. As the modern world became increasingly more populated, the future well-being of man concerned every man and indeed every woman. This concern led to the rise of so-called eugenics, that is a set of often para or pseudo-scientific uh, theories about how to ameliorate the human race. My work is concerned with how genetics, and especially these eugenicist theories, informed the writing of European women authors in the modernist period. I'm particularly interested in how um, then widely read women writers such as Sarah Grant, Mona Caird, Gabriele Reuter, Helena Böhler or Maria Eichenhorn used eugenics to further or criticize feminist concerns. As I have discovered, their fictional representations of themes such as motherhood, marriage, poverty, education and art all drew on eugenicist theories as the, these authors sought to impact debates on the fate of women in modern society. Many advances in European science came on the back of colonization. 
The colonial projects of European nations indeed propelled the development and institutionalization of sciences such as anthropology and ethnology, but also tropical medicine and genetics. I study Belgian and German colonial writing from the modernist period. Belgium and Germany were late participants in the colonial race, and therefore their colonial projects featured very highly on their national agenda. This national agenda included the popularization of these new sciences via literature and the overall knowledge production the bloody process of colonization brought about. Many colonial administrators, missionaries, scientists and travelers indeed wrote novels and partially fictionalized travel narratives which reflect their knowledge on the colonies. As authors, they could lay claim on being key experts and eyewitnesses. However, in practice, their so-called scientific insights proved little more than fabulations in the end. In my research, I'm interested how these white colonial authors deployed sciences such as genetics and discourses such as eugenics to construct and reinforce racial hierarchies and power relations. So I studied the popular fascination with astronomy and cosmic phenomena in the first half of the 20th century. So in the modernist period, astronomy took great leaps forward because advances in engineering and technology, well, they led to great discoveries that most people have heard of. Astronomy excited public interest at this time, for instance, through the first photographs of the Martian surface in 1905, they were very small, and the 1910 approach of Halley's Comet. Meanwhile, writers like H.G. Wells, Kurt Laswitz, Jules Verne, or uh, Camille Flammarion, well, they were doing what writers always did, at least since the time of Hesiod in ancient Greece. They reimagined cosmic spaces and they educated their readers about astronomical knowledge. So these texts by Flammarion and the rest, they were read and translated throughout Europe and beyond, and they reached enormous audiences of many classes, genders, and generations even. Through adventure, scientific romance, and other popular genres, countless literary texts like these and the magazines that housed them depicted things like cosmic collapse, and alien invasions, and uh, life on other planets, and other familiar tropes of science fiction. At the same time, it's interesting to note that authors and editors engaging with astronomy, well, they often had wildly differing political and religious views. So often, when they were setting out to imagine the cosmos, in the end, they turned out to be writing about life and politics here on Earth, so bringing outer space back home. Closely related to astronomy, cosmology only became an officially institutionalized scientific discipline at the end of the modernist period. Yet the study of the origins of the cosmos during this period went through a most exciting phase. We can think of the works of Albert Einstein here. Closely related to astronomy, cosmology only became an officially institutionalized scientific discipline at the end of the modernist period. Yet the study of the origins of the cosmos during this period went through a most exciting phase. We can think of the works of Albert Einstein here, but also of that of Georges Lemaitre, who here at the University of Leuven came up with the idea of the Big Bang, the thesis that the cosmos had not always existed, but had begun with a giant blast that to this day sees the universe expand into infinity. I study how, in the shadow of these physicists and cosmologists, experimental writers and artists of the avant-garde in Russia, France and Germany join forces to yield still different stories about the universe's origin and evolution. Interestingly, they could draw on some very famous examples, such as the Bible's book of Genesis or the writings of philosopher Blaise Pascal when he imagined the frightening infinity of God's power. Among many other things, the experimental writing I study has taught me that there is an innate literary or aesthetic dimension to all science. A physicist might produce the most far-flung theory, but if this theory is not translated in some aesthetic or narrative form, it can also not be communicated properly to an audience. And it is here, of course, that literature comes in.
what we've learned from this project? Well, um, quite a lot actually, but let me single out perhaps just uh, five general points. And that is, first of all, that literature in the modernist period, in all its richness and variety, uh, played a very important role in the dissemination of scientific knowledge. Um, writers not only introduced a very broad readership to a lot of scientific insights, um, they also weighed on uh, debates about the role of science in society um, and even gave shape to our present day idea of what science is. So second of all, um, writers in this process never simply reproduced scientific knowledge, of course. They uh, inscribed that knowledge into their own uh, fictional and textual artworks. And in the process, it often also happened that they produced new knowledge or devised a new language for inventions that were sometimes still to come. A famous example would be the word robot, which was invented by Czech writer Karol Čapek. Thirdly, uh, writers in the modernist period often also excelled in relating different sciences to one another, uh, drawing out um, uh, paradoxes, blind spots and parallels um, scientists themselves could not see because they were so deeply stooped in their, steeped in their own uh, scientific disciplines. Um, the uh, science of pataphysics, which was invented by the French writer Alfred Jarry, is worth mentioning in this context. Um, pataphysics, um, uh, Jarry claimed, was to pose all the questions the other sciences did not, such as, how big is the surface of God? So, fourthly, um, many writers in uh, the modernist period also demonstrate that literature is perhaps the last resource or place in which we can, or where we can think about the production of knowledge as a whole. Um, this is in part due to the fact that writers can literally write about anything. Anything really can become the topic of, uh, of literature. But it's also in part due to the fact that writers in the modernist period constantly reflected on what would be the best stories, the best forms to communicate knowledge with. Fifthly and finally, literature in the modernist period also learned or gained a lot of knowledge about itself, as it reflected so intensely on language, on narratives, on stories. It also got to know itself a lot better, and we see this uh, in a plethora of uh, experiments that are conducted uh, at the time, uh, but we also uh, see it from the many wonderful novels and poems that were written uh, in the period and read by sometimes millions of readers. Um, and this hasn't changed today. On the back of this project, we've made an MA course, and one of the gratifying things to see each year is how much students still like to read modernist literature.